Alexander, okay. Yes. You know? Well, you have to see how it's done to realize because oftentimes you're in class and teachers are using words. They, they don't even understand a lot of it, you know? Yeah. So. I'm serious now. I'm muted. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, why not? Let's get started. So today... We're going to look at a few things first, and then I'll try to bust into some new territory with some paint and, uh, you know, just see what happens. I'll, I'll explain it as I go. But first, let's step over to Studio B, and we'll talk about um, the difference between, let's say, traditional painting and modern painting in a big way and talk about the separations and how it's different and how it's the same. And then I'll probably take a pretty modern art approach to what I'll do today, but it'll be different than what you saw so far. It's even more dangerous. So let me um, go here. Okay. And uh, change camera. Okay. I think the cars are coming out early. Okay. So, first thing we're going to look at here is Edgar Degas, who was the famous French painter, post-impressionist, but didn't have much to do with the post-impressionists until later. Now, this is an early painting when he was young, and he, he studied under the great French master Ang, or Ang, Ang, and um, Ang was a neoclassicist, which was a period in French painting where you know, they're sort of taking the best of the Renaissance reality, painting realism as real as they can, using paint. Um, but it's sort of like this is where it changes, where modern art starts slipping. And so he's still a student in a neoclassical age. And he's older when modern art gets, but he shifts gears really quick. He ends up painting the ballerinas and things like that. So, um, I think in this one, you can see that it's so real that he had to have help, you know? So definitely there's lenses in there. His teacher used them because it's so photographic. And I think the neoclassicism thing is they take the best of the Renaissance, but they just keep making it more and more photographic because they have those devices, you know, available to them. And after a while, a lot of painters kind of stick with that, the academic painters, but modern painters just toss that all aside and start a whole new way of painting because they figured it was dishonest what the, what the schools were teaching young art students. And there were all kinds of new ideas in the air about color mainly. And then second, about how to put paint on. And I think the big statement in modern art was, was by Maurice Denis, who Matisse kind of ripped off a little bit. And he said, like, essentially, as a paraphrasing, before a painting's anything, before it's a picture, before it's, a, you know, a picture of anything, um, it's essentially, it's a flat surface with decorative color arranged on it in a certain order. And that seems to be what's more important about modern art, because in a painting like this, early Degas, it's more about the picture, you know? It's more about description. It's more about reality. It's more about almost a physical record or some sort of record for um, uh, for people to see from their time. And I, at this time, cameras are, you know, they're coming into play for sure. And Degas did use photographs, especially later. He cut them up and reconstruct the figures um, and make paintings out of them, especially in the ballerina and some of those weird poses. He, you know, ballerina weird poses, but he puts them in even weirder poses. So in this one, you start looking at it. The story is about an Italian banker, Alayli, and his family. And essentially, if you look at it, they don't look like a very tight, hubby and wife don't look very tight. She's like a tower of ice and he's just like a ghost figure jammed off in the corner. And she's kind of giving him the evil eye. And then daughter in the middle, I think, is dad's favorite. So she sort of acknowledges him, but she's not looking at him. The other one's attached to mom. 
But when you look at, um, let's, uh, let, let me step over. So when you look at um, this, things like this, let's say this black dress, how it's really part of the girl's dress too, and the sleeve. And look at where you see this black come down and come across the collar. It's all, it's all mom's dress and it's like a floating head with a collar. If you look at it that way, this is sticking way out. They become more like shields, almost like the shields. And um, over here, when I'm looking at this, I go, this is kind of strange because it's almost like the whole thing was painted a big black shape. And then he started carving the figures or putting the figures on top of it. And if you look at the white, it's like he's using a really stiff brush and pasting it on because it's got to stand up on top of that black. The black's so strong. He mixes a little green in after a while, but it looks like this is all, like I said, all part of the same layout, just that big shape. Um, the arms, she doesn't have the hands of her sister, but hey, she doesn't have hands. And then I looked at it and went, well, there's one jam back here, sort of the back of it on her waist, and you can't see this one. But I guess it just blends so much in the dark that it doesn't really matter that much. When you look at the furniture, I mean, the detail's incredible even a stack of letters on the table, the way you got the light on the paper and then in the shadow that mixes into the fireplace. And then when you look at him again, he looks like one notch underdone from everybody else. He's painted thinner and more scrubbed in and just off in the corner. And I noticed down here, you can kind of see the edge of the chair. And then there's these two red blobs down here that, what's that? So it gets kind of smeared and confusing down here because it looks like you couldn't really fit that foot in on the guy to make it look like anything besides something jammed in there. So you just kind of faked it. And I think people just, you don't, you know, just the brights, this color so bright that it takes your attention off of that. Okay. And then just pattern. He's got all kinds of wallpaper pattern, the rug pattern, which is a lot looser than this up here, which is a floral pattern. And then just the detail on these sort of things. I think it's a clock. Things on the mantelpiece, candlesticks, candles. There's a mirror with something, another painting reflecting in a mirror. And it looks like big ass painting, an early painting he had of uh, horse riders, jockeys. Something over here, I'm not quite sure. That almost looks like a whistler. Yeah, the English, the American painter that painted in England. And then there's a Degas drawing in here, a quick sketch of a head, somebody's head. And it's interesting how he uses a... Uh, this edge here is another room space, but the details, you know, you know there's stuff back there. It's almost like a drape over a window or something. It's up to you, but it opens up into another room, but it's just a compositional framing device also. And it adds another space to the painting, just like the mirrors do. You know, there's a whole nother reality inside the mirror. Um, what else can we say about this is this beautiful handling of skin tones. Now, when I look at this, it's sort of like he's doing a technique of his teacher, which was a lot of layers of glazes. And a glaze is pretty much a lot of linseed oil and some varnish, Damar varnish, and maybe a little bit of turpentine. And you mix up an oil consistency or an oil compound, and you start dropping paint into it, and you tint the oil. So let's say I got a cup of... Um, well, let's say linseed oil, what I just said, turpentine and varnish. So usually they call it thirds. You put a third turpentine in a jar, a third varnish, and a third linseed oil, and mix it all together. And it comes out nice and shiny because it had varnish. So you got a clear sort of shiny substance, but then you start tinting that oil. Like I want to use, I want red. So I drop a little red in it. And then I paint, let's say, oh, let's say blue since it's here right here. I got a glaze. I drop a little cerulean blue in it and mix it up. And then I paint this whole area that color. What? Then I got to let it dry. It's transparent because it's oil. So then I got to put another layer on it and that's got to dry. And then I got to put another layer on it and that's got to dry. And it's a very long process and probably working on more than one painting around the studio while they're waiting for other ones to dry. And that's a pretty big painting, I believe. And, um, you know, it just about takes forever. It's very meticulous. 
And that's what the neoclassical guys did. They get these very smooth, shining paintings that are hyper real. And um, his teacher was one of the best, basically. And his drawings are excellent. Ang's drawings are excellent. And I think that's where they got learned his drawing skill because he was, I go out on a limb to say he's one of the three best drawers of the whole modern era as they got. On. So um, anyway, when you're looking at this though, again, it's really about a description and getting accurate details right. I mean, even this one leg kind of bugs you, but somehow it's inferred that the leg's up here on the chair just with the knee kind of showing through the bump of the knee coming across here. And there's a really excellent oil sketch of this figure that they got that really roughed in with lines and he kind of finished the face. I saw it live in a, in a, a post-impressionist show once and it knocked me out, but it always knocked me out when I saw it in books and on slide. And I didn't realize it was that early in his career until I saw this painting and I went, hey, wait a minute, that's the girl in the oil sketch. And it's really loose and it's like indicative of what he's gonna end up doing later. So it's like, you know, he's already showing signs of breaking away because he's impatient and he wants to do it fast. And maybe he did this long enough and it becomes like punching a clock, going into a job. And maybe some of the excitement's gone. Like for painters, a lot of them just want to be there and be in the moment painting. And then when it's over, it's over, you move on. So I think he was coming to grips with that a little bit. So um, what else can we say about this? It's just really an excellent painting. And I mean, compared to what he ends up doing, he's excellent through his whole career. And they always use the excuse that he was his eyesight was failing. So he started painting more abstract and looser. And they said that about Monet too. And maybe there's something to it. But except at the JC, I, in the old days, they used to show a video of Degas they had. And at the end, they have a movie clip of him. Somebody had a camera on the streets of Paris in like 1904 or whatever it was. He died around then, I think. And it's on a city street, storefronts. And you look down the sidewalk, it's like a crowded sidewalk. And there's this old guy with a tall hat walking down the street about four storefronts down in a stega. And he's supposed to have failing eyesight, but I see him as he's walking, he looks up. And he sees the guy with the camera and he ducks inside his store. <laughs> he didn't want to be seen, you know, so I don't know how bad his eyesight was, but that was pretty good for a guy with failing eyesight. Anyway, um, in his late works, he really gets abstract. He starts drawing with pastels on heavy sandpaper because of the tooth or the grit of it. The chalk would stay and sink inside the sand you know, into the texture of the paper and he could really load it up because it was thick, heavy stuff. And he really liked to do that. And he also did mono prints, which are basically a paint on a plate, a copper plate, and you do one painting and then you run it through a press and you get the first one's the mono print. And then there's usually two after that are ghost images that it's the image wearing out as the ink comes off the plate, but it's the simplest way to print. So, he would have one mono print, the first one, and then the next two, the faded images, the ghost images, he would take and draw on them with his pastels, and he made beautiful drawings out of them. He combined the two. He did bronze sculpture, a lot of ballerinas, things like that. So he was everywhere, but he was just sort of this odd bird, and I believe it was one of his best friends was Mary Cassatt, the American painter from Philadelphia, who lived in Paris, and to be a lady painting at that time in that world was almost unheard of, especially an American over in Paris. But, you know, she got in with the guy really good. And he was an odd bird though. He was just, you know, they talked about how cantankerous he was and how he didn't like people and he shoot people out. So they had a good relationship. And I think she learned a lot from him in her painting because she probably used to watch him draw basically. So anyway, um, Let's uh, look at something completely different now in the modern realm, and it's a French painter, and it's sort of the same idea, a domestic scene in a home, but let's see what we got. And then we can kind of flip back and forth if we have to, but you got the idea of this now, I think, okay? Now, um, 
Here's one that'll rock your boat. Okay, so Matisse. Now, first, what can I talk about? It's, uh, he's in Tangiers with his wife, Tangier, and uh, they're gonna get divorced. Okay, so there's a separation between the two. So this is a story. It doesn't have much to do with modern painting, but you might as well know because they read up on it. And uh, they have all these tense moments, and he does a lot of portraits of her, and they always look sort of half there or unfinished, or he's not trying. But in a painting like this, you could say that in a modern painting, instead of the description, photographic description, it's about the mechanics of paint, paint handling and color. So when I look at Madame Matisse in the chair here, I see this line coming right down here, which used to be part of the arm of the body, but it gets painted out. And as it gets painted out, there's like a cup or a glass that looks like it used to be on a table. That was over here. It gets painted out and redone. Um, her dress was out here. You can see the cracked paint. You can see the underpainting or where the dress was. The chair had another leg. She had a bigger head or more hair. It's been redone many times. You can see how many times it's passed over. Um, part of the chair probably was part of the figure. So I guess the thing is that it's in constant change. So here's the deal. If you change something here, if he paints this out, you might have to come back here over to this side and paint something out. So when you, oh yeah, look, he was all the way out here, you know, and then he drops down he painted that all out. You can see the stripes from his PJs. And then that weird neck and back looks like there was a bigger head or something else there and he edited it. So he just, so what you're doing now, like Degas for his painting, he's doing a lot of um, sketches, drawings, studies, and he bangs them out. He does a lot of drawing. A guy like Matisse, Matisse draws a lot, but basically he doesn't do it for a painting. He just draws for its own sake. So all his uh, adjustments and changing happen right on the canvas. He's thinking out loud. Now, when you look at the landscape, and I imagine that this started out in a Matisse way more realistic, but as he keeps reducing things, things get painted out and the shapes become bigger and simpler. And that's what his teacher told him, who was Gustav Moreau at the Academy. He said, you know, you're basically meant to simplify painting. And what he meant by that is that there's a new painting coming in and it's not the old stuff with all, all the gimmicks in it that we saw before. And the way you paint, you're just reducing things down to like the most important things in the painting. So when you look at this background blue, it's not hard to imagine Richard Diebenkorn, the California painter, seeing these paintings and going, hey, looks like California. So he's painting in the Mediterranean world here and he paints in the south of France, which is a lot like the light of California. So when Diebenkorn was on the East Coast in the winter and in the Marines, he'd go to the art museum when he'd get leave. So he'd go to the Phillips Collection or the Barnes Foundation, they had tons of Matisses. And I think the thing that sort of got him was, it reminded him of home, the light of home. So he got interested in Matisse and then when they had that show at the De Young with all the, uh, uh, Deven Corn. Oh no, what was it? It was the Modern Art Museum. They had uh, Matisse and Deven Corn together, and then they showed all the Matisse books Deven Corn had. And he's got like 16 of them, <laughs> and they're all in a glass case, but they're all well worn. It's like he memorized those books, and that's where he got his chops from, is practicing that way. But look at how the window in the landscape outside gets reduced to almost like a wallpaper pattern. I mean, that's coming out of this guy. Let's see if I still got him. Uh, it was here a minute ago. Hang on. Uh, okay. No. Okay. Yeah. Hang in there. Here. Yay. So here's Gauguin. And you can see Gauguin's a generation before Matisse. 
And if you look, he's painting this landscape. It's starting to flatten out. And the figures get smaller, but it's almost like they're stuck to the field or the haystacks or whatever that is. But the way you get space is that it decreases the size of the figures and the figures get more sketchy or lighter. So they drift in the background. Um, the oxen here, they look like they're kind of like you're right above them, like a bird's eye view. I mean, the spaces are shifting all over the place, but look at how he takes like vegetation or trees or whatever, and they're turning into patterns or abstract shapes, even the heads here. They just got color pieces put together and they're almost like becoming pieces of a pattern on wallpaper. And basically, Matisse comes along and he takes that and even pushes it further. And he loves Gauguin because of the pure color. And he also loves it because of the really flat space. And then the way he starts making things abstract pattern, he picks up on that. And we get here in about 1918, right after World War One. And uh, these paintings probably went on a really long time because they sit around the studio and every time you look at it, you feel like you got to change something. So even this nice curve here, same curve here and the blue bleeds right in. So it connects this bright green to the painting because of the blue that's in the background of the painting. And when I look at this, it's really conceivable that the window was bigger and this whole railing and grill went across at least past the figures or maybe even the whole painting. Because just the way you look at the different colors, it's the same blue, but there's different coats of it. And maybe sometimes it gets mixed in with a little white while he's painting. So there's very slight variations of that color. So that just suggests that he's painting a lot of things out because the blue keeps changing. Um, what he does with flowers, they become polka dots almost. With this tree, it was added on, it looks like, because here's the original tree here. And he slaps the side on it, a darker side, because I can see the flower bed underneath the tree. It's cutting right into it. So it's fading through the tree. So he decided to make it less of an egg shape and bring this down. And when he does it, it gets more of a squared off three-dimensional quality to it. And then again, it's like big, small, smaller. It's just like those figures. It's as flat as a wall, but it still looks like it's marching back to this building or doors or window or whatever it is. And um, the, uh, you know, when you look at, you looked at Degas with all his wonderful sort of skin tones and smooth blending and that. Well, with Matisse, it's more like building with putty and scraping it off and putting it back on and scraping it off. And, and that's his process. Add and subtract, add and subtract, and then at some point it gets kind of a balance when you're looking at it i always thought this was the strangest painting in the world but now i look at it and i find it interesting and then when i look at Diebenkorn's figures from the 50s and early 60s i can see exactly who he's looking at he's just doing it his own way so he's the guy that what he did the um like what we just looked at the guy and the guy sort of moves into modern art. Well, he's the guy, the next phase that takes it even more modern. And then Diebenkorn, the Californian, takes Matisse and makes it even more, let's say, contemporary or modern in our terms. So there's a nice string right there. But uh, him and Diebenkorn are inseparable as artists. But the big thing about it is they're from two different parts of the world that look the same, but they're different cultures. And, and painting just glossed right over that and it doesn't matter politics whatever don't matter it's painting you know it's all about painting okay so let's uh see what else we got here real quick oh yeah ready to get on that okay so um matisse before the painting i showed you had a group of painters called the fauve painters f-a-u-v-e Everybody had a name then, Fauvism, you know, the isms, we've been through all that. So this is one of his friends that later um, completely changed the way he painted, painted more like Picasso. It was Andre Duran. And Duran had another friend painter named uh, Vlaminck. What the heck's his first name? Eh. Mm, I'll get it. But it was Vlaminck. And 
they went down in the south of France looking for pure color, the sunlight. And he started painting in this really crude style, crude and direct and layered and heavy paint. So we get the same things here, bigger figures. And as they go, they drift backwards. And they get smaller and less descript. You look at the sails, they're setting up some kind of rhythm to move back in space. You look at the buildings. Yeah, you can tell there are buildings and hills and stuff, but there's not a great deal of detail. It's just these broad or chunks of paint. They're almost like chunky paint. And it's just built up with paint. Again, it's like uh, physical material, like putty, rather than something that's rendered and blended and turned into an illusion. It's more of like the artist hand at work, working on the canvas and pushing it around and this and that, you know, and until it gets this balance. But at this point, they're still going out and painting. You got tubes of paint, you're going outside and painting and maybe bringing them back to the studio and touching them up or working on them. But again, it's just about, this is almost like a mosaic, you know, and it's instead of tile or glass, it's just paint. And then I think that movement only lasts about a year. And then everybody moves on and they, you know, they start doing what they're going to do. And they were called Fauves because they had a show in Paris, The Wild Beast. And a critic coined it because he walked into the show and he never saw anything like it. And they were shown with neoclassical sculptures, which are like, they, they got real perfect, like Greek sculptures that were fake because they didn't apply to their time anymore. And um, the critic said, well, it looks like Wild Beast came in and slung paint around on canvas and ran out of my amongst these Donatello-like sculptures, which is a Renaissance sculptor. So that stuck with them. And then, okay, so it breaks down, the Fauve movement, and when Matisse turns into something else, he starts going into something else. But I have an early, earlier Matisse, like a show where this came from. Let's see where that is. Um, wait, no. oh. Uh, what an interest i think it's interesting that he outlines everything in black to all the shapes almost like a cartoon uh, sorry i couldn't hear you what, what was it <laughs> i was noticing that he outlined everything in black the sails and the mountain and the people yeah i i, I suppose if that wasn't there it'd really be chaotic yeah you know it's like the string that just holds the composition together and the funny thing is they end up painting these, him and Vermeer end up painting these really weird brown paintings of like they went out to the woods and painted and there's no color in them. And ah, you don't, you don't know what happened to them. You know, it's like, why do you do this now? And who knows, you know, everybody's got the reason for changing. But he said, now Monsieur Duran is over on Picasso's side. <laughs> they were, they were competition for sure. Okay. So Here's an early Matisse painting Notre Dame. He painted the same scene because his studio was right here across the river. And I mean, there's so many, I was in Paris standing right here in front of Notre Dame. And, you know, I knew all his paintings. So all I did was just sort of look at this and then I just spun around and pointed right in the direction where his window is. And you can see the studio exactly where he's painting. And he painted this over so many different versions of this over and over and it gets more and more abstract the first one it's a little bit more you can tell what it is it's a little bit more architectural and, and then by the time it gets to this phase the critics are saying well how could he paint Notre Dame like melted ice cream and in the water like concrete and the boats won't float they look like sweet rolls or eclairs and look at how he paints figures down here and it's just all this sort of textural paint now i guess what you could say is when we get to a certain point the picture is gone and it just becomes about the language of paint and almost what you have to think about is it's like a banquet table with all these different foods on it and they're all organized a certain way you know here's the crusty texture section uh here's the smooth texture section here's the color section so you start reading the paint like it's a subject instead of looking for a subject. And that really happens in American art. 
when, when they hit total abstraction. And, you know, the, the message is the medium was the big thing in the 50s or early 60s, I guess. And, I mean, that it was already here in painting. But there's one where the last one gets very geometric. And he's got lines going all over the place. And a lot of this just disappears. And you look at it and you go, hmm, what's up with that? And that's the painting Richard Diebenkoff's corn saw when he taught at ucla they had a matisse show and that was in the gallery and that's when he started doing his ocean park painting so you know it's somehow it's all it's all thrown in a box and connected but let's uh let's move on here let's see all right so get to the end oh here let's do this one okay let's set it up my uh, lab technician is not here today, and the butler is off for the weekend. All right, so we got, I found another one, Ocean Park, and oh, there's a bad highlight on it. Let's see if I can... Get rid of that. Still bad. Okay, hang on. Better. All right. So when you look at this, just think what I was telling you about the Matisse painting now, except it's totally flat. There's no people in it. There's nothing else in it. But this is like an eight by nine foot painting. So if you just take this section alone right here, and let's say you draw it out on this big canvas and you wash in a layer of blue, okay? And then you start drawing other things out and laying in sections of paint and get it all filled up. And then you look at it and say, wait a minute, this section of blue is too much to this side. So I got to bring this section back over here halfway and paint over that blue. And then I got to drop this one down here and repaint this. Then I got to bring this. So the way you arrive at your painting is mistakes and corrections and then the paint has its own drippy quality and this one's as transparent like a watercolor that it will light anything up any space up because it's so brilliant because of the light coming through it and he did that with oil paint kind of a trick to do but after a while i mean you got to figure well that's a big painting if you use thick paint that's a technical problem it's going to crack you know, you're going to have all kinds of problems. I think a lot of painters arrive at that later because they know how to make thin paint look like it's more like it's thicker paint or there's more going on in it. But even in these, allegedly did 10 a year, plus hundreds of drawings, prints, you know, watercolors and little paintings. But these things must, you know, there's sections in some of these I saw where it looks like he had to paint on a ladder. I mean, they're big paintings, but there's some that looks like you just threw it on the floor and dumped turpentine on it and started wiping stuff, mistakes off, and then put it back up on the wall and started painting on it again. And it's all this sort of like erasing, redrawing, erasing, redrawing, painting, redrawing. And at some point, it all kind of congeals together and it becomes a tight plane, almost like a trampoline. Bowl. But the thing about his painting is that when they're this big, you know, like Cezanne started to flatten out space of a painting. It's like he started lifting up tabletops so they stand up a little bit and then stuff sits on like bottles and dishes. So they look like they're weighted down, but they're still starting to stand up. And then Picasso comes along and takes that idea and he stands everything up to the point where with his cubism, where the illusion is almost like because it's a flat painting and he's painting rectangles over rectangles it starts coming out of the canvas visually to about this far you know it's like that far out of the canvas instead of going into the canvas the painting used to be with perspective and by the time you get to american painting like Devencorn, you can be like 10 yards away and the light coming through it jumps out of the painting so it's not so much heavy paint rectangles like Picasso it's just the ambient light coming out of the painting and it also has the look that you can run through it into infinity 
So it works both ways. You can go into it forever, like looking across the ocean out at the beach or through a window, you know, and you're seeing fog or whatever, but then the light's coming back this way. And I, I read about some author somewhere. He was talking about coming to California and he couldn't believe how a painter could paint transparency and make it solid at the same time. I remember being in Santa Cruz and just looking at the fog coming in, covering some buildings with the light behind it. It was the same thing, you know? It was the same sort of idea of light that he's using in his paintings. So it's like he was raised in California. So it's in his blood. You know, he knows how things look. He knows how things feel. So anyway, just so you know that, like, he's a major painter and he lived in Sonoma County which is pretty big because if you go anywhere in the country, it's not like, you know, in Wisconsin, it wasn't like having Matisse living in your backyard. And that's what's happening here, basically. He's that important. So, okay, let's get rid of him. And let's just go here a minute and look at these two abstract paintings. Okay. Wait, before I do that, just talking about things sort of one thing leads to another here i got this to show you and there's a few of them so working them out well okay and stay please okay let me get closer Whoa. okay so this is turner the english painter Joseph Millard Turner, Joseph Millard William Turner, JMW, okay, Turner. So what Turner does, is he goes to Venice and he starts painting the canals. And Turner was like a very, very good architectural painter. Every detail he could put in these buildings and his early paintings, especially, they're very detailed watercolor, pen and ink. And uh, very, like I said, mechan they're almost mechanical. And then something happens where he starts changing things around and he starts melting everything and getting rid of all the detail. And in a way, he starts painting the weather instead of the objects. So you get these boats in the canal. Now, there's a big tradition of Venice canal paintings by Italian painters and the Venduti painters. And they painted small pictures of big scenes. Probably one of the most famous ones is Canaletto, who ended up going to England to paint the Thames River and stuff, you know, he had a career there basically. So Turner comes, the Englishman comes to Italy instead. And it happens to be the home of Titian. And I never put those two together is that he saw Titian paintings. He saw, you know, and I looked at some of his orange skies, it's right out of Titian. So he went there to look at the Titian paintings and he's doing something so weird with his paint at this time, 1830s. Uh, it's like, where did this guy come from? Because England's got a tradition of writers for the most part. Yeah, there's some painters, but they're heavy in the writing. And this guy, and their painters are usually kind of academic and I, I don't think very inspiring. There's a few of them, but this guy's like from another planet. He was dropped down in England. So, you know, it's just radical what he's doing. and. Then he went back to his watercolors and he's seen like using heavy watercolor paper and putting it back under the faucet and using sandpaper and scrubbing things out. Nobody would, in 1830, that's what they did in New York in the fifties, you know? And he had a champion named John Ruskin, his friend and the head of the National Academy of Art in England. And Ruskin was his mouthpiece and promoted him with his very architectural paintings. And when he started becoming himself, Ruskin stopped talking to him. And I thought, well, nothing lost there. The guy's going to keep you from being who you are to satisfy who he, who he wants you to be. Forget it. Time to walk away. And that's what he did. They stopped talking. And I don't know, Ruskin wrote a big book on it, on art. And he starts complaining about Turner all the time. Anyway, so when you look at Turner, here's another one. Okay. So this is just really weird the way this works. Okay, so originally a Venetian went to London to paint. 
Okay. So then the Englishman oh, Jesus. goes to Venice to paint. And then, well, here's Turner. Let's look at him. It's getting a little more melted. You can see that it's just like somebody poured turpentine on it. It's just slowly moving down. And as it moves down, it starts taking away detail, making things shapes and lumps and more suggestions of things instead of being so specific. But look at how beautiful that light is and how luminous. And it, hey, look, it looks like David Korn's Ocean Park. It's the same thing, the way he's using the paint the way the light's coming through and the luminosity and all that stuff I told you about jumping out of the canvas. It's here already, but they never talked about it that way. All right. So anyway, and I also think his watercolor technique is starting to influence his oil technique very heavily because he's got some lighter ones that are thick and they never look as good as the thin ones. Okay. But okay. So Turner, let's say he goes back to England. So now we get a French guy in on it, Monet. So the French guy goes to London to look at Turner. <laughs> and this is Impressionism. So you can see where Impressionism starts. It starts with Turner, but really it goes back to Titian. But in art history, you can't term it that way because it's categories. But if you got a painter's eye and you look at it, it's the same thing. They're in the same ballpark. But an art historian wouldn't tell you that because sometimes they don't paint lots of times they don't paint and they don't make those connections. So anyway, when you get Monet, you're getting an impression of a scene. And you got the London bridge, you see London in the background barely. So he's taking Turner and pushing it even farther and making it more obscure, but he's keeping the picture. And this is a later Monet. I was surprised. I didn't think he went to London that late, but he did it early in his career too. But see how he's painting, he's painting the air in between you and whatever the thing is, the objects. He's painting the weather also. And that's what his impressionism was about. You kind of know what it is, but it's not stamped in concrete. It's more made out of air and vapor. Okay. So, and then quickly, there's a Frenchman who goes to London named Albert Marquet, who's Marti Matisse's crony in the Fauve movement. And Marquet paints the same bridge. And he paints it, um, it's not as bright, but I take it more like it's a certain time of day and the sun's going out because it's got the same versions of this, but they're really bright. Now the water's bright orange and blue and Duran went there also. All the folds I think took a turn there. But I think the interesting thing here is when you put that white slab down, a paint, and then all these little people, a wagon, but they're just brushwork. They're just gestures going in the right directions. Uh, light poles, this kiosk, the bend of the river is a compositional device. The way he does the water is uh, really, um, it's kind of muddy, but it's like a green color. And then he just puts, loads up his brush with a white or maybe a darker color and just streaks in and he's got water, okay? So, Anyway, that's Marquet, and I think that might be for that. That might be it. Now, one more thing before we get rolling here. Okay, let's see this one. All right, because I want to deal with some heavy color chain stuff today. So. First one, let's put this one up. We saw it before, maybe. Okay, so this is Philip Guston painting in New York in the late 50s, and these paintings from the early 60s. And you know what? I look at it and I think, Yuck. wow, it's New York in the 50s. I bet if Monet lived in New York in the 50s and 60s, Impressionism would probably look like this because it's coming out of Impressionism, you know? And uh, I'm just checking here. Okay, hang on a minute. Okay. Alejandro. Alejandro. Yeah. Stick around after, I need to talk to you, okay? 
So just stay online when we go off. I just want to see some of your paintings, all right? You there? Yeah, okay. All right, so just hang hang tight, all right? Okay, so um, when you're looking at this, you could say that it's that buffet of pain again. Ooh, there's a juicy piece of pizza. Oh, there's a nice bright orange piece of fruit. Look at that salad. Look at the green, you know, it's just sort of got that idea. But when I looked at it, I thought, hmm, I know how Philip Gustin looks. And this is a pretty big painting. It's probably early in this series. He changed later. He started making the more caricature paintings like he did when he worked for, uh, during the Depression, painting murals in public buildings like Coit Tower down there. They had all the artists in the country working so they could eat. So he did these sort of murals of the, the weird figures like inquisitors, Spanish Inquisition figures, and all this weird stuff in kind of a cubist way. And then he starts going abstract later. And then towards the end of his life, he mixed this with his mural kind of idea painting. And a lot of people can't dig them because they're kind of weird, but the more I look at them, the more I like them as slave work. I'll try to find some of those later. But when I look at it, look, there's a head, there's an eye, looks like another eye, looks like a mouth, looks like it might have started as an abstract self portrait and he had it. So he just loaded up his brushes and let it fly. And I think sometimes you have to do that to get into new territory. You have to get so ticked off that what you're doing that it like, forces you to go over the edge to try something different that you haven't tried before. And that's usually like throwing paint at the canvas or throwing the brush at it. I remember doing that in grad school. I had this big painting and I took it outside. We had studio, took it outside the studio and walked about, oh, 15 yards, 10 yards away from it and turned around and looked at it. And I didn't like it, so I had this big house painting brush, and I just flung it at the canvas, and it did a perfect spiral. And as it was spiraling, spiral, spiraling towards the canvas, I realized the painting wasn't that bad. At that point, the handle hit the canvas and sliced it right in half. <laughs> so, buyer beware. <laughs> Look at it before you throw. Anyway, um, I think the interesting thing here is that you can see how he starts out really light, like Monet's color. And and it's really thin. And as he works towards the center, it just gets pasty and gooey. And I mean, we were learning this stuff in graduate school. We would get like uh, 12 jars or cans, peanut butter jars, um, you know, canned good cans. And we'd paint every day. There was another guy in the studio next to me. So we worked it out the best between me and him. We had the same teacher and uh, you put white in one can, black in another, put some turpentine in and mix it up to the consist consistency of half melted ice cream. So it's slick, but it's not really drippy. I mean, you still can put it on the canvas without it sliding off, but you might get drips and things, but you can thin it out later. And we'd mix up other colors like a light green, a light violet, a light pink, kind of impressionistic colors. But we would have all these cans of paint where we didn't have to mix it anymore. And we had big canvases and you could just have at it a bunch of different brushes and certain brushes would stay in the can so you don't cross mix them and start getting things dirty, okay? And uh, at the end of the day, it was hell cleaning the brushes. I mean, we used to use laundry detergent like era. And by the time you know, we had like 20 brushes each, we use a day. And by the time you get done washing those with soap, your skin's peeling off. <laughs> but the gloves are a good idea. Anyway, that worked out. That was a lot of fun because we were just really dealing with paint and painted shapes. And the teacher was turning us on to all this stuff. So we were learning rapidly at that point. And of course, after that, you develop your own way of doing things. You know, you add on to it or subtract it or find your own way as you get older and you paint more and more. There's, skip, there's steps you can skip. But anyway, this one, nice, juicy sort of clump of paint. All right. Now, just in the other realm here, where did that one go? Now, here's one that's, let's say, a guy painting, I believe in Paris. It's a Japanese painter. And the 
this is the 50s. He might have been painting in New York. I'm not sure. But the painting goes this way. Okay. And it's sort of the same idea as Gustin. But let's just look at, you know, you got these two really crazy abstract paintings, right? Just with brushes and there's no real picture and it's these shapes and it's almost like nature did it it's like a field of rocks that have been worn out you know and walked over for centuries but uh it's not juicy it's almost like a an old fresco in a cathedral that's been there for five centuries and the texture of it is like the plaster is peeling off the concrete you know and it's dry and rough and then when I look at there's a drip going down here and a drip going down here. But when I look at it, I think, well, that's a pretty odd placement for this shape. It almost seems like it's hanging or floating. Look, looking for things in a painting. Here's a profile of a guy with a big nose and a mouth and a chin. I mean, literally, that's how people start looking at finding things in paintings after a while. Maybe we'll deal with that today. But when you see it, um, it's got too much white around it, you know? So I put it this way, right? You can get a big old goofy face out of it, two eyes, a nose and a mouth, a crooked head. I mean, that's really pushing it, but I mean, it just sits in the canvas a little bit easier this way, but because these things are sticking out equal, it's just not a very dynamic composition. It looks like you painted a lot of stuff out. You use the white to paint things out and make it simpler. And I think maybe if you left a little bit more and just attached it to another edge or something, it would have been a stronger design. But still, the way he's using the colors and the way he's putting the paint on is kind of interesting. And remember, at this point, the world's not ready for it. They're still not ready for it, a lot of people. But this is what people are dealing with with paint in New York. And that's important because the art world was in Europe before World War II. It was completely there. And after the war, the whole art world moved to New York and it became very important. And it's important also because of its kind of painting, this abstract painting that the world didn't see. And I don't think Europeans really got it fully. When you look at their abstractionists from the same time, they're trying to get the look, but they, they don't quite get it. You know, it's just, uh, a, it's a couple minutes under baked, I think, you know, they didn't quite get it completely. And then, you look at a guy like de Kooning, he's the guy that set the pace for everything. So we'll take him on later. All right. So there's that. Now, let's see. Today, oh, let's do this. Here's your birds last week. So, well, I got wings and I got a beak. <laughs> but anyway, um, I really beat the heck out of it and turned it all different ways and kept painting on it. And then it finally got to this point. I go, should I make a bird out of it? And I go, eh, be too geometric. And this is a strong enough design because it's a small canvas. And I made the bigger shapes to kind of make it seem like it's heavier. You know, it's got a little more oomph to it. So that's that. All right. Now. I love that. So today. Oh. one of these odd size canvases let's get it lined up here <clears throat> and it's uh i went to uh michael's yesterday morning before class that i had yesterday let me uh straighten this out so you can see the whole thing and i went shopping all right so i'm there in the morning and i look and they got a sale on canvases that are if you buy a canvas, they got signs up, back stapled, which basically means the canvas goes around the back and it's stapled on the back, not on the sides. So buy one, get one free. All right. So I go in, I'm looking at 24 by 36 inches, which is not huge, but for a class like this, it's pretty big. And I used to buy them for under $30, something like that. So I went and looked at it and said, hey, that's a good, and it was $43. And it's like, no way, you know, I'm not, even though you get two of them, you know, I'm not paying that. So I looked around more and then I tried to find 
you know, I just scour the shelves and they always miss something or there's always something illogical about the way they price things. So this was $17.99. I go, okay, that's doable because I get another one, you know, and it's nine bucks each basically. And then I looked around more and they had much smaller canvas than this. It's probably 16 by 20 inches. If that they wanted $17.99, the same as this, I go, forget it. You know, I'm just going to get the big one and it's a weird odd size which is hard to do, but it makes it a more interesting painting. I think if you pull it off and if I turn it up, it'd be nice for a figure, a full size figure portrait, not human size, but it's getting, you know, it's 36 inches long and 12 across. So, and then this way, of course, it'd be the typical landscape. But what I want to do is let's say camera real quick. Surprise! No, it's it's me in here now because the light's low. Hang on. Let's put that light back on. Ah! Okay. Um, so this is, see this? This is from a show I had in 04 in some place in Petaluma, read more books. It was a cool bookstore, actually. But what I did with this was basically took paint and just dropped it from the tubes onto the canvas. Then I started smearing paint around. It was like a Rorschach test. I was looking for stuff in it. Then I realized I thought of a painting by a painter named James Enzer, who was a Belgian painter and he stayed in Belgium. And then his counterpart is Edvard Munch in Norway. Oh yeah. The thing about those two guys is they never lived in Paris. They stayed in Scandinavia and uh, made their paintings outside of the art world and they did fine you know they did excellent paintings and there's a painting by Enzer called price enters brussels and it's a huge painting and it's in the gettys museum and it's all these he painted skeleton heads and mask on a big group of people marching down the street and it goes back for like a mile all these heads and they're all painted crusty and sort of made up i go hey that's kind of nice i want to do something like that so i did and this painting it's in here somewhere in one of the piles. I didn't have time to drag it out, but it was all faces. And I realized it's too much. So I had to paint them out and put a sky and then break it up with this tree. And I realized it looked like a faculty dinner party. Things <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoy. Okay, so um, let's do something here. So the first thing is, all right, let's try to put some paint on. And then uh, see if we can find anything in it. Oh, <laughs> it'd be good if you could see it too. Let's go back to that. All right. Ta-da, okay. So I'll just start, I don't know, like that. And then I'll do a little bit of this if it comes out. Now, this might be a good time to break out. Let me get it. One of these. Heavy duty palette knife. Or if you want to bake, that comes in handy too. But I want to do that. Over there. Over there. Okay. So before that dries, this won't do my old pull it off. I got some left. Down. Now the idea is to keep it kind of crunchy, you know, thick. I'm not worried about it like on other paintings where I want it flat so it's not funky. Okay, that. Um, let's say one more here. There's a lot of y'all. We'll just put that there. Like that. Okay, look. There's a face already. It's a bug man. Okay, um, uh, the thing is getting rid of these papers. You got to have a separate pile. So like I do, I keep stepping in them when they're on the ground and wet. Okay, so enough about me. Whoops do this next. Okay. 
some of that. And this color is a little bit more sticky because it's older. It's drying out. Okay, I'll we'll leave that. And then I'll use up this red. Michael, could you tell us what colors they are, Keith, when you okay. put them on? Cadmium yellow. Yeah. Earth umber. Okay. Turquoise. And this one's, uh, what is it? It's crim It's napful red. Okay. It's just red, basically. Yeah. Thank you. Common red. Okay, so here. And here's the beautiful part is you don't even have to think about the colors. What it's mostly about is the thickness of the paint, building up some sort of surface that you can start seeing things and painting over and making things out of it like I did in that. Well, we'll see what happens here. Okay. Uh, let's do this one. And then come back over this one. Okay, so now you start getting different things happening. It could be anything. I mentioned the bugs. It could be bugs. It could be objects. It could just be blobs of pain. It could be a still life. Okay? So that's when we get into painting. You start seeing your options, even when you're doing the same thing the same way of painting, you still have options of making it different things. And that one's pretty thick. Well, let's do this. There. And by the way, why don't I make it easier on myself by doing that. All right. Then it will bounce all over the place. Whoa. That's a wet one. All right. There. And then one more. So let's put that over here. Okay. Now, use it all. Because since you're using so much paint, it's a good idea to make sure you use it all. A lot of it likes to stay on the paper. That's almost like what I was talking about in the monoprint, the ghost image. The first one's, and as you go, it gets thinner and weaker. Boom, 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 like that. Then they, they guy would come back and draw on these two. And keep the final print as a final print. Okay. Um, there's always room for what do we got here? Crimson. I'll put some there. See, so what I'm trying to do is cover the field also. I don't want to get stuck in one little area. You got to keep it wide open because when it's wet like this, things will start mushing together and not looking like much, but one just big rectangle of mush paint. So you got to leave some space in between them. So maybe some have time to dry. So when you start working next to it, it doesn't disturb it, its shape or anything. It doesn't get in and mess it up. Okay. So let's put this here, some over here, down here, and maybe over there like that. And then I want to put another color next to it because I just like the way things mix in with this, you know, by accident, you get accidental colors. Um, let's see. It's a good one here. Let's try this. Cerulean blue. All right, next to it, next to it, underneath, a little bit, some here, some here. Oh, red and low. All right, there. Okay. And. Smack that down. Okay. So now, same thing. So I'm going to go for it. 
So now, let's just do a few things here before I continue doing this. We should kind of get it. Um, we get it. We see it happening. But now there's, let's see, is there another phase you can do on this? And where did that go? Okay, my black. Yeah. I need my secret eight carton palette. Eight cartons. Save your eight cartons. All right. Punch some black. Okay, so look. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, what do you got here? I don't know. I'm just paint something. Oh, let's try a uh... I'm gonna break out the white. And then we can start doing stuff like this. If you don't like, if there's certain people you don't like, just paint them. It's good therapy. <laughs> See what's going on here. Um, hmm. All right. that around a little bit see so there's no again this is just like moving paint in different directions every once in a while take a poke at something and make it into something but if you find yourself getting too um self-conscious or conscious about the image then you go back and take some of that paint off and push it down and maybe we can make a repeat of that face right there so let's start something up new over on that side over there okay now um and this is where painting is kind of fun because you're not responsible to make it look like a photograph you can just kind of play with the paint and the color and just start moving everything around and see what happens i think the main thing is to keep the color clean and if you have to keep some of the white of the canvas, it starts turning into a mess or else let it dry, you know? So because painting this way could really turn into a disaster, it starts just muddling into one another. The colors, let me move this. All right, so let me see what we're doing here. All right, so maybe um, in the foreground, well, I'll just draw for a while on it. Don't want it to dry. It's twice as hard to clean then. So symbolic painting yes this meant something to me don't ask me when okay. uh, need something going over there maybe a diagonal over there
here. Let's do uh, something here. This is where, believe it or not, this is where drawing comes in handy because you have to know what to do with it. You know, and drawing doesn't always mean drawing like a photograph. It means drawing across the surface and knowing how to design things while you do it standing up thinking out loud. Okay. And here. There. And do something here. Strawberry. There. Uh, there. Okay, so now in. That off and move it over here. Okay, and let's take some of this off. Take it all off. Okay, man. Doing a fine job of get, messing up the white. Okay, so even now, at this point, you might let's say, there's my dip brush. Let's try something drippy here. Okay, so now we got the drips coming down slowly. Come on. Well, <laughs> that makes a mess. Okay, here it goes. All right, so do that. Do some of that. Do something in there. Can't forget about the corners. So I guess I'm establishing a horizon line. I have no idea how it's, you know, I'm just winging it. And that's basically what this kind of painting is, is just seeing what's going, happening and going with it as it goes, as you're doing it. Look, right here. There's the bird that was supposed to be last week. Yeah. It's a hybrid hummingbird. <laughs> okay, so um, let's, I can't forget about those edges, so we need to find a green. Guess I'll have to mix one up since I don't really have a good one. What is this? Turquoise. Hey, wait a minute. Okay, let's add yellow to that. All right. Mix it up. Turquoise and yellow. Hopefully, yeah, it'll be more of a green color. I start painting in between a little bit here. chunks and mash them in a little bit and see what we got okay so that's kind of starting something who knows what but keep going right now it looks like a graffiti wall or something in a war zone but um let's see do that Before I do that, do some of this again. Eh, yesterday, I don't have newspapers around here, and it was recycle day, so they're wondering who the bum was stealing their newspapers out of the recycling up and down the street. Oh, it's me! <laughs> talking about I, I think I told you this when I put the gesso on the canvas the gesso's wet 
this is exactly what I do to get really bumpy textures, is put newspaper over the whole wet canvas and tear it off really quick. And you get that sort of texture like a wall in a house, a bedroom wall or something. You know, it gets all kind of bumpy and crunchy. Okay, so let's uh, go back with doing a little more of the dumping stuff on it. You know, there's a certain point, you keep doing this, and there's a certain point where you really start seeing stuff and it starts going, it starts painting itself, I hope. Okay, so. It's hard to see on white, so let's mix it in here. Put some up here. Over there. Come around here. And down here. Some thicker stuff down here. Okay. So now uh, it's time again. something there it's a bird on a head or something but you know i mean that's where we're at. right now you just want to get stuff set up then you sit back on your chair and drink a six pack and two bottles of wine and you'll start seeing things <laughs> not recommended and so um Let's make it a uh, no oh, blue vine. A little bit of blue. Uh, and there. And this time I'll break out the uh, let it go. There it is. It's a good idea to think about shape size so they're not all the same size. Like, if I made these faces, I'd want to have in the foreground probably a bigger head like this. And then, like I talked before in the paintings, they get smaller as they go back. So it looks like they're going receding in space. Okay. Okay, so paper. Again, and then maybe we'll draw a while. See what we got. Oh, that's pretty big there. And, um, I'm going to clean this off here. Really put this palette knife, palette spatula. Okay. Okay, so let me see what's going on here. Okay, so now uh, here, let's try it. Right brush for the job. Okay, so eh, just 
Yeah, I guess that's good. You still can see. stay the same so you gotta start somewhere and we'll go on. right there just like that one so now we're getting into it uh, I'll keep that and see what else we can pull out of here for now uh, okay I'll make him into something or something. Could be a hand pointing that way. But I don't know. I'll just leave it for now. And then come back. What do we got here? Yeah. So I guess what I want to do is just get the uh, black kind of spread out just like all the other colors. And do something here like that. Come back over here. There. Crowd scene, hey. Just like we do that with pen and ink. They wanted to make me a cartoonist with the college paper. And it took so much time that I didn't do it. But the guy loved my cartoons. He ended up being the head of DC Comics in New York. He was a senior then. I was a sophomore. Okay. Let's find that horse again. Mr. Ed. Okay. And there. And sable balloons. Okay, now I gotta get back and start looking at it. He's starting to look like a Moreau painting. Long Moreau. Um, <clears throat> all right, now I'd say it's time for a little whiteout. Start put some more brightness back in it let's see let's try a different brush okay so and maybe we can mix that white with a little color just so it looks like you can see it okay so let's use some of this can't really you got to paint over things edges and things also it looks like you're just painting and that's not the nature of this it's busting through to happen more accidentally because then you can find more things you're not looking for things that you never thought you'd do a certain way because it just happened and you go with it oh yeah that looks good no try that okay there and come down here okay so let's see what we got here all right, so the editing process is starting. Um, okay, now let's try something different. Upside down. 
been that way a while. All right, so uh, we'll go back with uh, some more just stuff. Burnt, burnt umber there. Put some burnt umber here. Some in there. Okay, and then uh, red and umber. A winning combination. Okay, there. Uh, Where'd it go? Oh, over here. Okay. So now, same thing. You need a lot of paper. Leftover paint, let's put it in a dull spot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good at that. Hang on one minute. Okay, I gotta get a different instrument here. Oh, somebody wants in. Izzy, you're in. Okay. So, wait a sec. Okay. All right. So let's see what else. Let's get some white spots back on it. But before I do that, I just want to flatten out those things a little bit more. Let's go a little big, a little thick. Yeah. Right next to it. And then grab that one. And do this one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is really, it's abstract painting, you know, to keep it abstract or make it images or whatever, but it's just sort of like getting at it right away with the paint, not having much of a plan, just a general idea. And you put things down and you just respond to them as you go. Does it look good or not? You know, that's the idea. Okay, so... Do it the same way as the other stuff. Put some there. See, I got to think about these. Edges are so important. And I'm feeling it. And across there, since I'm doing that, I'll answer it up here. More paint. It's kind of watered down the light. Some in there. Dab it on. You like Van Gogh. So what he would do when he paints is just this, load up the brush and just dab away. Okay, so let's see how white that stays. Yeah. All right, so that's done. 
you know, I lost this thing again. It's the thing is, it gets pretty physical. You're pushing, pushing a lot of stuff around, beating up the canvas. Things start falling apart. Okay, Let's see what we got. All right. Um, hmm. Hmm. Decisions, decisions. Okay. They'll go after some of these spots that haven't been touched yet, but I'll try to keep them clean so it doesn't all just turn into the same thing. Okay. So what's the, um, hmm. Eh. I'll go back here. This is more of uh, a tinted color of white. We'll try a different tint. Sure. All right. A little bit of blue, a lot of white. Blue. All right. Um, Okay, so let's see what we got. Let's go drawing probably again. Let's see. All right. Oh. You know, it could be any, you know, it could be a crowd at a football game. It could be anything. But that's just, uh, go back to search and destroy. Looks like a mirror. Yeah. Yeah. It comes out right into that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cross there. Right here. So now it's like you're tying it all together. Trying, yeah. I mean, there's going to be a certain point in this where I'll have to let it dry, right. you know? Right. And we got a few more. We got a little more time. I'll work on it until, you know, the top of the hour. Then it'll dry and I'll stare at it for a day or two. And yeah. Don't forget to show it to us. Don't it's forget what? To show it to us next week. Oh. Maybe. <laughs> I'll hold you to it. I'm corrupting you early. Ah, uh, no. No, that's a long time ago. All right. Uh, okay. And then uh, give it a minute. Okay. Um, Let's see. Yeah. You gotta get rid of this. Oh. Forced. Okay, so getting gray. Down. Alright. And then more. Just to push the black lines, and so they don't look like you consciously painted them. 
the more shit you know that we can get and mush together. Some more white, probably. Um, right in there. So let's find that brush. And let's find the color. You know, the thing is that I pushed the paint down so much that I might need to start puffing it up again with the tubes. Uh, mm -hmm. There, and there, and then let's take, where else you got here? Some of this ochre color. Get the palette knife and just smear it. Okay, um, hmm. you know, I'll need something brighter. Okay, let's go on the, some of that stuff. And you paint this way, you gotta have buckets of paint, though, you can see. And I'm gonna paint a small picture if you try it because it takes a lot of paint. Um, Um, now it looks like we got a sun or something going on here. Yeah. Let's uh, mash it a little. Let's see, which one for this one? So now I'm lightening up a little bit when I rub on it. And then I can do some of that over there. Lighten up a little bit. You know, pull too much off. There, yeah. that's fine. Okay, and almost a little watery here. This one. Put 
put some of that yellow over there. And that up. Yeah, so this one. Better. Once it's too watery, you pull some of that water out of it. Oh, it's cold. Okay. So now let's stand up. Oops. See what we got. Okay. Um, well, what was I going to, okay. Let's uh, just, let's see, right. drawing. So now. Maybe. Okay. Um, hmm. Let me just start making smaller shapes. Okay. Maybe there'll be something, maybe they won't. something dark. Okay, let's see what we get out here. Alright. Uh, oh, kind of All that newspaper on the floor. <laughs> So I'm just making some little notations here and there. What I might do. Some black on this edge. Okay. Uh, that uh, washed out area is too much. Let's turn that away and see if we can see the whole canvas. There you go. Okay, so um, let's say let's do something.
maybe this is my good share. It's a face. It's a composite. <laughs> it sounds like there is a didgeridoo there. The island of Dr. Miro. Uh, yeah. Okay. And let's see. Yeah. yeah. Do that for now. And one more thing here. Another shape in here. There's one here. It's just like drawing over, painting out, drawing over, painting out until either you see something or you can't stand it anymore. Um, one last before I stop. At the end of the day, I would do this just to make sure it's easier to paint on top of. I still got enough paint on it. Wow. Now, all that stuff because it's starting to dry out. can live with that right now um let's move that over so at this stage this would be a good chance for me to let it dry because i'm starting to see stuff i can go with but i'm not absolutely sure i don't want to put too much black in it and uh you know i want to keep the colors clean so i want to make sure it all dries and once it dries it's like i'll put another layer of just the way i started on and keep some of the old painting, this painting, in with the new stuff on top and try to merge them and make them different things out of the new layer and the old layer. You get what I mean? You just, you know, you just keep building on top of. So you can uh, stay tuned for next week's episode. <laughs> and we'll see how far it got, how crazy it gets. But I'll tell you. When you get to that point in painting, it's like being a kid again, and you can just express yourself without, um, you know, worrying about pleasing people. And if it works out, there's always somebody that's going to appreciate it and see it, you know, and know what you're doing. So who cares? Have fun. Okay, you guys, let's see. Gallery view. I'm Anybody have any questions? No. Nothing. But no, but that was, that was wonderful. Okay. What's that? I said that was wonderful. Okay, <laughs> good. Did you get it down? Yes, I'm looking forward to watching it again. All right, good. Yeah. I, I, I can't wait to see these things, okay? Cool, and then, thank you. Um, well, I guess that's it. If you guys don't have any questions, I'll see you next Alejandro, week. Alejandro, who needs to stay? Somebody needs to stay. Alejandro, are you there? <laughs> Did he spit? I'll see. Don't worry. I know. All um, right. I'll bye. take care of it. So you guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. I'll good see you bye. next week.